I'm going to be talking about network perimeter redundancy, not necessarily specific to PFSense, so whether you use you know, OpenBSD or you know, commercial firewall or anything else, a lot of this will be applicable there as well. Uh, this is based on uh, deployments that I've done for a number of our uh, commercial support customers uh, in highly redundant environments. Uh, first, an introduction to PFSense project, free, free BSD based firewall distribution. Um, managed via a web interface, so you really don't have to touch any of the underlying command line stuff, but it's all there if you want to mess with it. Uh, the configuration is all kept in one XML file, which makes it easy to back up and restore, move to other systems. Uh, it's founded about five years ago as a fork of Monowall, uh, but the way Monowall is designed, it's a, uh, it's a very limited system, but by design it's you know less than 8 meg at the time. Uh, but there's not really, it, it's limited in its expandability, and there were a lot of people who you know, wanted to do more, add more services onto their firewall, and it's really, uh, Manuel, the founder of the project, is very strict about, you know, I don't want certain things in here, and I want to keep it very, very small. So that's uh, where this project came from, um, and expandability was a focus. And the, the project ran for two, three months without a name, and uh, eventually it just, you know, Scott Elric, the other uh, founder of the project, uh, came up with PSSense. He was like, oh, no, no Google hits, domains were available. Uh, that was one of the things we ran into as an issue for a lot of other things, so we figured out what the heck. Um, we had no better option, let's go with it. Our CVS server is actually, its host name is Project X to this day. Uh, <laughs> but then we went ahead with that, you know, thought, hey, if we want to, we can change it at some point in the future. And uh, we, we brought that up at, at one point, and well, the overwhelming uh, majority of the user base said, leave it alone, or who cares what it's called, it works. Uh, there are 12 active developers that have committed at least once in the past year, and uh, there have been 27 uh, committers in the uh, five years that the project has existed. So why for BSD? We're using all these great technologies from OpenBSD, why not use OpenBSD? Um, this was 2004, so it, things have changed significantly in the past five years, but uh, these reasons are really still the same today. Um, wireless support was the primary one. At the time, OpenBSD didn't have WPA or WPA2 and had very limited uh, driver support, whereas FreeBSD had uh, all of those things. <coughs> and that's changed some, but now FreeBSD is still ahead in wireless. We, we got the, the BAP code, the virtual APs, where you can run multiple access points in the same wireless card. Um, so while OpenBSD has improved, FreeBSD also has. So. That's uh, still, a, still a consideration. Network performance at the time, uh, Monowall just moved from 4X FreeBSD to uh, FreeBSD 5. And one of the uh, workloads that had a very significant performance degradation between 4 and 5 was networking. And even more so whenever in a, in a firewall scenario with uh, multiple interfaces. And so if you had a little Socrus box, 133 megahertz, 486, that used to be able to push you know, 17 meg or so, it went down to about four. And people were screaming and screaming and screaming uh, about not being able to, to push the kind of workloads that they wanted. And FreeBSD 6 brought it back up to something like 12 meg or so. At the time, OpenBSD was considerably slower than FreeBSD. Some of the stuff that Henning was talking about earlier and some of the other developments in OpenBSD in the last five years have pretty much made the two a wash uh, at this point, except there are uh, scenarios at the higher end where um, our first committer is, a, uh, is the head uh, firewall admin for a Fortune 500 company, and he has several hundred OpenBSD firewalls around the world. And in the higher throughput parts of his network, OpenBSD just can't keep up. He's switching out those boxes to, with uh, FreeBSD because uh, FreeBSD with PF can handle the loads and OpenBSD can't. Uh, that is improving, but FreeBSD is still um, ahead there. For most environments, it's, it really makes no difference whatsoever. And that's not nearly as much of a consideration as it was five years ago. Uh, familiarity and ease of fork was another one. Monowall came from FreeBSD, so staying on FreeBSD made it easier. Um, it uses IPFW for the Captive Portal um, and some other things that are specific to FreeBSD, so it, it was less work to, to stay with FreeBSD, and that's what we, we were most familiar with. Not really a, a consideration if the other first two weren't there, but uh, 
It was just another plus. Yeah. I remember at one point on your website you had like a roadmap section and one of your plans and implementations was you're gonna migrate to the dragonfly. Is that something that's been completely abandoned or do you still consider that some No, that was something that I don't know, it, it never said that we really would. It said we would consider it or, you know, look at it. Um, it's not a serious consideration, uh, really has never been. It's one of those things that, well, well, we'll see where it goes, and maybe that will make sense at some point in the future. Um, but, no, uh, we're, we'll be on FreeBSD for the foreseeable future. And you know, we just don't have the, the people resources to support multiple OSs. I'd love to have a version that's on FreeBSD and another one that's on OpenBSD. But uh, it's, it's everything we can do to just maintain the one that's on uh, FreeBSD. The downside is that we have older versions of the OpenBSD software because of the improvements going to OpenBSD first and making their way into FreeBSD later. So if something makes it into OpenBSD today, it might be you know, a couple of years before we see it in FreeBSD. So why would you use uh, PFSense? Yeah. It hides a lot of the complexity of the underlying configuration and the systems. And it makes it significantly easier to manage for, for most people, um, especially the you know, point and click types who you know, they they aren't familiar with the command line. They don't want to learn it. Um, so it, it, a lot of people who are capable of configuring it themselves, they find themselves um, using pfSense because you know, there are other people who need to administer their firewalls who don't necessarily know it and they don't want to learn it. So. It's so easy in MCS you could do it. And it's a customized OS. It's not, it's FreeBSD based. There are a, a number of kernel changes that, uh, that we put that's specific to um, the, the functionality that we have. So why would you not want to use it? If, if all your administrators are very familiar with the underlying software and you don't have anyone who really needs a GUI, and you know, that, that it would make more sense to stick with what you're doing now. Or if you want the learning experience and have a lot of time to burn, it's a great way to learn all about all these different things to, to set it up all by yourself manually. The uh, current stable release is 1.2.2. It's on a FreeBSD 7.0 base. Uh, I'm currently beta testing a 1.2.3 with a 7.1 base. Um, none of the actual uh, PFSense code has changed, but we're um, testing the, the newer FreeBSD base because it seems like there's Quite a few users who are hitting uh, issues as they're upgrading their 6.2 and 6.3 based systems to the 7.0 base, they're running into a lot of hardware regressions. And 7.1 seems to resolve uh, a, quite a bit of those. And 2.0 is currently in alpha, and that's the, there are a lot of significant changes in uh, that code base there. And uh, that will soon be moved to 8 current. Here's a, a few of the modifications from stock FreeBSD to give you an idea of some of the things that we change um, from what you would find if you just went out and, and installed FreeBSD. The IPsec in FreeBSD falls apart at about 80 connections or so. There's uh, issues with set key. Um, I'm not exactly familiar with the specifics because I really wasn't the one who worked on it. So we have uh, one of our users is a major retailer in the, in the Netherlands and they have like 400 sites or they, that they wanted to connect uh, and start falling apart on them so they um, actually paid an IPsec tools developer to fix this issue and we've got it uh, we have patches so uh, the largest deployment we're aware of is 400 um, connections on one box but we don't think there's any upper limit on it right now and IPsec NAT-T is another one um, that is not in FreeBSD I think it's been added to head not too long ago, but uh, we're using the same NAT-T patches that a number of commercial develop or, uh, commercial firewall vendors use for, uh, for NAT-T support. And we have a patch for PFIL ordering. PFIL is where in the FreeBSD kernel the, all the filtering, um, all the packet filters tie in. And in stock FreeBSD there's a hard-coded order. And the processing order, because we use IPFW for some things and um, PF for most everything. Um, we have a patch that lets us use a sys control to uh, change the ordering of how they're processed. And there's some wireless enhancements that Sam Leffler uh, pointed us to from um, that he backported 
the uh, a lot of the wireless stuff and head back to uh, Rolling Seven, or uh, so we can get it in Seven One. So we're uh, we're currently testing those in One Point Two Point Three, and they seem to work really well. Uh, we made a re uh, change to PF's reply to whenever you're doing multi WAN with PF. Uh, if you're, you're weighing firewall rules, you put reply to on there so it knows to route it back out the same connection it came in on. Uh, problem with that is if something on the same subnet hits that rule, then it's going to route it out back to the router rather than directly back out to the uh, the same host on that network. So rather than putting in or forcing people to or exposing that option to end users and forcing them to configure it correctly and negate the uh, reply to for same subnet traffic or Putting in some complex PHP logic to add rules and negate that. Um, we've got like a two or three line patch to uh, PF that if the traffic is coming from the same subnet of that interface, it does it just skips the reply to. And uh, we have no bind add addition because um, with PF with certain protocols like FTP, you have to have a daemon that's listening on the firewall itself, uh, pick up that traffic to properly handle it, and with BINAT, which is one-to-one -one NAT, it's, it, nothing listening on the firewall itself can listen, and there is, it can pick up that traffic. It's forced uh, in it's both through it. Anyway. Is it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you might see that on previous deal about four years. Ago. Yeah. <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> Maybe. So we, had, we added a change that we can uh, just exempt a, a port <coughs> on that so we can use the FTP proxy with one-to-one -one NAT. And occasionally we run into hardware that is supported, but the PCI IDs are missing in the driver or you know, something that for various NICs or, or other things, and we'll you know, add patches to add those things. And uh, for LCD support, um, the little front panel LCDs that you commonly find on commercial boxes, uh, a lot of those require kernel patches so the, uh, the UGN driver doesn't attach to them, so then the, uh, the LCD package that we have can then attach to them, so we have some changes there for that. And um, model well from what PFSense is based on is, uh, is a popular base for similar projects like this. It's uh, There's been uh, three major projects now forked off of it, and new in 2.0 we've really revamped a lot of the underlying code. The model well code makes a lot of assumptions that you're running a firewall or you're running a box that has, more than, uh, that has at least two interfaces on it. Um, that's all been changed now, so it can really be used as an appliance building framework for anything. So that limits the need for, for forking if you want to create a project like this. So you don't have to duplicate this code base and maintain it multiple times. And it's also good for uh, building rebranded commercial releases for, that we do for a number of companies. Okay. So the Never perimeter, perimeter redundancy. This is a few of the things that uh, I'll cover. Starting with just a very basic two interface firewall and no redundancy here. And we'll be, uh, as I go through this, uh, each step of the way we'll build upon this basic uh, diagram there. The first thing is uh, multiple, or multiple internet connections, choosing your internet connections. Um, what's available for you, pricing, reliability. Bandwidth, um, like uh, for one of the ISPs in the area where I live, is a the, the cable ISP is very fast but not very reliable, but cheap. So you know, consider things like that. Uh, sometimes you can get different kinds of connections from the same ISP, so you don't necessarily have very good redundancy with those uh, unless they're on significantly different networks. And uh, the cable path, another thing to consider, because of cable seeking backhoes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah, even if you have different kinds of services, like a T1 and a DSL, generally those are coming into your building on the same you know, 400 pair or 200 pair uh, copper. And you know, one cut can easily take those services out. Uh, cable usually follows a different path. Fiber usually follows a different path than that. But that's something you'll you'll probably want to bring up with your provider to uh, make sure that you know, you're at least have a decent amount of protection from cable cuts because that could take you out for long periods of time. And then uh, 
you know, wireless services, you don't have to worry about that at all. Unless the back of the swings around and knocks the wireless off your building or something. You have to worry about heavy cloud cover. Have to worry about? Heavy cloud cover. Oh. If you're still using a T1, yeah, a lot of times companies can get a you know, cable modem and a DSL connection, they get plenty of bandwidth that way, and you get a heck of a lot better redundancy and usually pay less money. So that's something to consider. Okay, so handling your outbound traffic, you use policy routing to direct it. You know, it, load balancing or failover, uh, depending on you know, how you want to do it. Most of the time, people like to use failover because they want to know this kind of traffic is always going over this connection. Unless it goes down, then it's going to automatically switch over to the other connection. Um, and make sure you have reverse DNS in place for all WANs, like well, primarily for mail servers. Uh, otherwise, your mail will probably start getting bounced if you fail over to uh, another connection. And uh, if you have any kind of services that are IP dependent, make sure that you uh, give the IPs for all of your WANs to those service providers. And for inbound traffic from the internet where you, you know, open up things coming into your network, uh, make sure you have those services provided on all your internet connections. And your public DNS, if, uh, even with you know, all, all of the redundancy, if you build it all in, if your DNS isn't uh, set to, to take care of things, it's, you know, everything else that you've done is, is not going to work, at least for inbound traffic. Um, if you outsource it, make sure you have, you know, proper redundancy and reliability, and, you know, you got to be careful about DDoS, because generally when you outsource to another uh, provider, you, you got a thousands or millions of other domains using the same DNS server, and if somebody else that happens to tick off somebody and, uh, you know, gets the <coughs> DNS server knocked offline, you're going to be affected by that as well. If you host your own DNS, even if you, your company only has one physical location, you probably want to make sure you can get a DNS server in multiple locations, uh, primarily for mail delivery. Is if, uh, there's a lot of MTAs that will just bounce mail if your DNS isn't responding at all. And if you have another DNS server that's at least responding with you know, your MX records, you're not, you may not be able to actually receive the mail. But they'll usually queue it up, and you know, once you get everything back up and going again, it, the mail will eventually be delivered. Uh, if you're using uh, multi-WAN, uh, usually if you need to fail over for your public services coming in, you need to make manual changes. Um, you want to make sure you're using a low TTL on your DNS records, time to live. That's how long uh, DNS servers on the Internet are supposed to cache your uh, records. Whether or not they do is sometimes another story. For the most part, DNS servers do obey the TTL and caching, which you'll find that there are you know, a fraction of a percent that don't. Uh, and some people like to use round robin, so it bounces between one WAN to the other, and then if one of them goes down, only half your requests will fail until you manually update your DNS usually. And we have a DJB DNS tiny DNS package available that can act as your DNS server. And it's actually capable of automatic failover. You can set it to monitor a certain thing, and if that fails, it will automatically change your DNS record. So you can use this in combination with multi-WAN to automatically failover for your incoming services for public DNS. Okay, so then if you add multi-WAN, you, you take that initial diagram, you add the second ISP, you still got multiple single points of failure. So firewall redundancy, you combine CARP, PFSync, and uh, PFSync has its own XML or RPC configuration sync. So if you make changes to your primary, they automatically go over to your secondary. And CARP is what shares the IP addresses between the firewalls. They each have their own IP assigned and they have shared IP. And the shared IPs are what you actually use on your network. They were used as your default gateway on the inside hosts. and. Uh, that's what you use for your, your public services on the outside, whereas the IPs that are assigned directly to the systems are used for just management purposes. And then the uh, firewall state synchronization is so when you fail over, you don't lose all your connections. Uh, in some environments, that's, you, know, you can fail over without having states and you'll never notice. In others, it causes a significant network outage. Uh, but you always want to fail over with the states if at all possible. And the configuration synchronization just pushes the changes over to the secondary anytime you make changes. So if you add the uh, firewall redundancy in, it changes this diagram out to this. Question? Yeah. 
So like a T1 that would have a CSU, DSU, and yeah, a router? Like something, something terminating those connections from the ISP other than the firewall. Mm -hmm. yeah, you, well, yeah, you can still do it that way, though. Yeah, it's, yeah that, then the router becomes the single point of failure at that point. But I guess I'm not sure exactly what you're asking. You can do it with a, a router on the outside. So I'm trying to, I'm actually thinking about my own part where I'm trying to solve this problem right now where, where I, I have the capability of terminating these two or more ISP connections into my firewall or into my redundant firewall situation. But then I also have a Cisco router that's available that I can terminate the connection there. So I hear what you're saying about that being a single point of failure. I'm just, I'm just trying to, I didn't know if there was a couple of slides in front of this thing that like a, like a, ISP or router or something like that, and I just missed that. No, no, that's, depending on what kind of connection you have on the outside, usually for each WAN, you're going to have a single point of failure, whether it's a cable modem or a DSL modem or a, a router with a T1 on it or something like that. Um, and that's not really something you can accommodate usually. Um, so that's why you get, you know, multiple internet connections, because if, you know, that if that single point of failure it craps out on you, then you can have the, you have the other connections available. And it also has support for server load balancing um, using SLBD and 1.2. Very basic. It accepts connections uh, on one public IP from the outside generally, and then it round robins them between servers on the inside. And uh, it, it monitors the servers uh, to, and if it you can either use TCP or ICMP. So if the, it's not very smart. If uh, if TCP port 80 is open, it considers a server up. It doesn't matter if it's serving a web page or not. Um, but for a lot of people, that's okay. Uh, and or if the pings fail, then it takes it down with ICMP. 2.0 uh, has relay D, which is significantly smarter. That work is mostly done. Um, it can actually check response codes out of uh, uh, requests, and it can modify headers, and there's a number of other things that it can do. It's not finished yet, and I uh, have a, more information on that once it's all wrapped up and we know exactly how it's going to function. But it's significantly more powerful than uh, the old SLBD. So that leaves another um, single point of failure with the switch on the inside, which is kind of going to vary depending on how exactly the inside of your network is. If you just have a very simple, flat, single subnet internally, um, or whether there's a router there or something like that. Yeah, what we usually recommend doing is dropping in another switch there and having your primary firewall on one switch and your secondary on a different switch. So if you lose one of them, you, you still have the other uh, firewall and you didn't uh, just drop everything off of the network. And uh, link aggregation and failover with lag four is coming in 2.0 to give you ether channel, uh, LACP. Those are two different means of bonding ports to uh, between your switch and your firewall. Um, and it also has failover mode where it'll use one interface, but if that interface loses link, it'll drop back to a different interface. <clears throat> and it also has low balance mode where it'll use uh, both of them. And then lastly, uh, power redundancy. Uh, generally. If you have multiple power feeds, maybe if you're in a colo environment, you get two power feeds pulled into your rack. Uh, if you're in a business environment, maybe you have two UPSs. Uh, you can just split this right down the middle and power one side off of uh, one power feed and the other side off the other power feed. And that way, if you, uh, if you lose either one, you're still in good shape. And shameless plugs. My uh, book on PFSense is coming soon from uh, Breed Media. And we do have commercial support services available. We paid my way here and uh, pay our way to the other BSD conferences as well. Questions? For Relinky, um, 
for the HTTPS support, are you you're actually you have an HTTPS server built in, and you're sort of doing a, a loop back through it? Yeah. Yeah, so the, the firewall itself terminates the HTTPS from the internet, and then from there, there's another HTTPS session to the internal server. So you, you initiate another HTTPS connection? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's the way. It, I haven't actually used it yet. I tried to get some information from the developer who wrote it, and then uh, when the internet was out earlier, I couldn't get back to the information that he hopefully has replied to me with. But uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure that that's how it works. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned your uh, your friend who was running OpenBSD and now is replacing with FreeBSD. I'm curious, do you have any data on what the breakpoint was? Like, well, apparently, how high his traffic went before he really started building? Only for the highest scale ones. Um, and with the two U HP boxes that he's using, I think he said he'd get up to about 500,000 packets per second through open and about 700, 750 through free. That's something wrong. That's way too low. Yeah. Getting way more. I don't know. He's he's got several hundred open BSD firewalls, and he knows he knows what he's doing. Uh, well, I hear talking to <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, I know. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not sure when the last time he tested. I don't know anything about specifics. So I'm really not very familiar with it. But he's only getting 500,000 packs a second on half piece of hardware, and he's doing something dramatically wrong. Uh, there must be some fuck up. I don't know. I can have him get in touch with you if you'd so like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm not familiar with the setup either. I just the the only way out, easy way out for him was to to switch the really high load ones over. Yeah. With some of the improvements that you've had with uh, moving to FreeBSD seven and looking at uh, eight relic, uh, are you have you had any? buy-in from other, like, appliance developers, like, actually starting to look at you versus Monowall, or... I mean. Yeah, um, the free switch is a VoIP platform, you know, competitive to Asterisk, um, and they are, we, uh, we have a free switch package right now, and we're, um, going to be building an appliance based off of that in the not-too-distant future, um, the DSpam developers came to us recently, uh, looking to build an anti-spam appliance, uh, so yeah, this has only been around for um, you know, a couple months or so, and we've already had a couple. So yeah, yeah. Uh, I can't hold a candle to the people who are running 400 on, on firewalls, man. But I have to satisfy the user who rolled out PFSense you know, on the Alex to about a dozen places where I can make a firewall because it's less hassle than we answer questions from people who would ostensibly be maintaining it otherwise. So I had two questions. Uh, one is, what do you have in terms of roadmap for uh, either packages on the embedded platform or some way to roll an embedded image from a working image on a server somewhere so that I can, you know, I could, like have DNS server, for instance, you know, or uh, Citrox speed or something like that on the embedded platform. Would be very happy. Yeah. And the second question is, can you speak to the availability of IPv6 and support for IPv6 in any way, shape, or form. Right now, I'm running other stuff behind, and I appreciate the ability to nap through packets and IPv6 IP to something behind it, but I'd really like to get back down to the box. Okay. Uh, as far as packages are embedded, in, uh, in 2.0, we're going to move embedded to a nano BSD based build, which really significantly changes um, the way that embedded is done. Now, that doesn't necessarily add any kind of package support. But as part of that, I think one of the things that we're going to do, and this really it, it is still kind of in the early stages, is we'll have a small embedded image that doesn't have any packages on it, and then we'll have another embedded image that we build in every single package that's compatible with embedded. So that's kind of what we're thinking right now. But... Um, Somehow, some way in uh, 2.0, we will support packages uh, on embedded. And IPv6, we do have a developer who's currently working on it. Uh, we just recently switched our uh, revision control from CBS to Git, and uh, he has his own uh, <laughs> he has his own uh, branch in there where he's adding IPv6 support. And I'm 
I'm not sure if that'll get into 2.0 or not. I would like to see it in there. Um, it really depends on how far he gets with it and if he's able to finish the work and if once it's finished it actually works uh, reliably and across the entire system. Cause we'd, if it's going to be in there, we want to make sure it works with every single component. It, it, it is something that looks at first blush to be very simple and it in fact turns into an enormous action. Yeah. 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 Is the ET airing on uh, two? Is it a match of four years? <laughs> <laughs> no. Nah, um, it's hard to say, but I suspect that it'll be a stable release by the end of the year or so, roughly. Um, I expect we'll have it in release candidate, you know, mid this year, maybe third quarter or so. Um, generally, we leave things in release candidate for a long time as we're cleaning up the you know minor edge cases, and because we don't want to put out a release until we we've, we've resolved every single issue with it, even if there are, uh, you know edge cases that only a few people are going to run into. We don't want to put that out. Uh, so, yeah, that's... It, it'll probably be in a very stable, usable state for 99% sometime in, you know, the next six to eight months or so. And that last 1% is hard to nail down, though. So... Any other questions? Yeah. How much of your time do you put on it? Is this full-time for you now, or do you still have another job? It's... Um, it's a second full-time job right now. <laughs> we are making enough money off of uh, commercial support that it's um, it could, you know, hopefully, if it continues to grow, it uh, become a full-time job for us in the not too distant future. So, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Do you have a general rule of thumb? Um, like when you get requests for packages, you have people submit packages. I mean, you have a you have an appliance which you on one hand are trying to um, align towards kind of a pure, simple function, and then the other hand, people are asking for functionality and you know, like you kind of you have a certain philosophy that you use to juggle that. What on whether or not a certain package will be accepted or? Oh yeah, I mean, I mean, there's no certain. That's kind of why we have the packages. We're pretty strict about okay, you don't want to, you're not going to run certain things on your firewall, or we don't think you should. Now, other people don't really care, and they have difference of opinions there. But one of the nice things about the package system is, you know, we can put stuff out there that you know I would never run on a firewall, but you know, maybe other people want to. Or maybe they want to then take that package and then build an appliance off of it. Um, and that package would also exist for the, you know, the firewall distribution as well as the appliance. So we are we really don't say no to packages. If, if there's a package that works and somebody wants to add it, then sure, have at. Um, but as far as adding things into the base system, we're really going to be pretty strict about that. We're not going to you know, add anything crazy that... And we really wouldn't want in a firewall to the base system. That's why the packages are there. Any questions? All right. Thanks.